of those oh, 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 stories. So I bitch about games too. You know, it's got a little bit of everything. Talking about monkeys. Monkeys? Oh, that would be very appropriate for this, wouldn't it? Well, here's the thing. I got monkeys or zombies. I'll just read two thirds of each. <laughs> What's that? Just uh, I would call it Al, you know, I've been looking for another project to pick up. What's your name? I'll give you credit on Facebook for that. <laughs> I was going to work on book three today, but somebody gave me a great idea. <laughs> I should have this done in about six months, then I'll get back on book three. Um, judgment call, I'm going to go with monkeys. Yay! Hello, young Rafus. Um, I've been wondering about men lately. In particular, about boyfriends. I've been asking my girlfriends why we seem to have attachment issues. That's not your question. I want to know why most men seem to like to play games with their girlfriends. Like, I'm not going to call for a couple of days and see if she cracks and calls me first. Or if they just deal with distance better than us women. My friend and I call our condition the kiss and cuddle syndrome. The only reason we go back to our loser boyfriends is because we want to hold them and kiss them and squeeze them until our, their heads pop off. <laughs> I'm rambling, but what this comes down to is I need to know why my boyfriend who lives in Minneapolis does not call me, goddammit. Signed, Anitra. Well, Anitra, I have a good answer to your letter. Actually, I have two good answers. Luckily, due to a psychotic break brought about by midterm stress, I have two fully formed personalities willing to give you their opinions on this issue. First, Evil Pat's response. You know, if I wrote this now, it would just be Evil Pat's response and then Eviler Pat's response. <laughs> I was younger then. Oh god, I forgot the direction this one goes. Okay, let's go there together. I wrote this a long time ago. So why are guys thoughtless, callous, game-playing jerks? Simple, Anitra, because that's what you women have trained us to do. <laughs> let's, let's, let's ride through this together and we'll maybe, maybe we'll unpack it at the end, right? Let's just have this as the experience for now. Let me explain with the story. Imagine that you're a young boy, and like most young boys, you're a nice guy. Innocent, polite, and considerate. You meet Julie. She's smart and funny and pretty. You become friends and slowly but surely you realize you're in love with her. So you join forensics because she's on the team. You cheer her on when she tries out for swimming. You talk on the phone for hours at a stretch, fully getting to know her. But while you're investing time and energy into building an emotional and intellectual bond with Julie, some basketball player asks her to the prom. And she says yes because he's a junior and he has his own car. Plus he's got an ass to get about a quarter off of. Let's call him Jack. Then Chad proceeds to cheat, treat Julie like crap because he doesn't know the first thing about her. But for some reason, she clings to him like he's the last, last, last life preserver on the Titanic. And all the while, there you are, her friend and confidant, and every night you're on the phone listening while she cries about how obnoxious and thoughtless he is. But she forgives him because she's in love, right? And then it slowly dawns on you. Julie will never be your girlfriend. Why? Well, given the overwhelming evidence, Julie doesn't want a boy who listens to her thought and thoughts and feelings. Julie wants a cretin with a nice ass. Guys like Chad will get love. Guys like you are the equivalent of an emotional tampon. End of story. Now, it's possible that you move on with your innocence intact, and then you meet a girl called Erica. Leather, rinse, repeat, repeat, repeat. After you slide down this emotional razor blade about a dozen times, you know what you get? You get me. I'm not nice anymore. 
Over the years, I've molded myself into an arrogant bastard of such vast proportions that women find me irresistible. <laughs> and you know what? It works great. You can get radiation burns from the amount of raw sexy I throw off. <laughs> You'll notice this was a newspaper column. You know, I could, there wasn't a picture attached to it. I could kind of create my own story there. So now you're complaining that your guy doesn't call you? Get bent, Chicky. You women have made your collective bed, and now you get to lie in it alone. Yikes, Robert. And here's a nice cat's response. Well, Anitra, your letter reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend last week. She told me she liked getting massages. More than that, she considered them essential for her emotional well-being, especially when she was in between boyfriends. She went on to explain that she thought touching and being touched was a vital part of being a primate, which means, in a nutshell, that she feels like her inner monkey occasionally needed some love. Personally, I couldn't agree more. I think that deep down, we all have basic monkey urges. Do you remember that experiment that we all learned about in Psych 110? The one where the baby monkey had to choose between two fake mommy monkeys? They still teach this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and given the choice between a non-cuddly uh, monkey made of chicken wire um, and one that had milk and one that was just fuzzy, the baby monkey always chooses the fuzzy monkey mom to go and cuddle. We'll go over here drinks milk, then it comes over here and cuddles with this other fake mom. What this really proves is that I think scientists had like really unhappy home lives. They're <laughs> taking it out on monkeys. Um, <laughs> uh, no, baby monkey always chooses the furry mom. This goes to show how important this cuddling impulse is for us primate types. So, to answer your question, Anitra, I decided to perform an expanded version of this experiment. I added a balsa wood monkey with a cookie and a handgun, a sheet metal monkey that gives out bong hits, and a monkey made entirely out of Cool Ranch Doritos that gets drunk and burns you a cigarette. Oh, well, that's not funny. I'm just making myself sad. Um, Anyway, to make a long story short, I never got around to finding a baby monkey to experiment on because apparently you need permits for that. <laughs> but I can tell you that my favorite was the razor wire monkey with a taser that dispensed sweet, sweet methadone. <laughs> I still sleep with that one at night. What's the moral of the story? I have no idea. <laughs> Scientists hate monkeys, I guess. There's your moral. I'm out of here. Have a good spring break. You could tell I was writing to a word limit there, and I didn't have a strong closure. <laughs> now, before we move on from the funny monkeys and methadone story, we need to rerun this to the, to the evil past response, because in the geek community, as all of you know, we've been having some problems with how we treat and perceive women. So, reading this here in this culture, it's like, I wrote this as a joke, hyperbolic, I mean, you know, a couple of weeks before I talked about trying to make kitty pig to get what you want from your hall director. I mean, the nature of humor is lies and hyperbole. But the fact is, this, let's, let's take a moment here. This evil patch response is really an exaggerated version of a very commonly held cultural belief and I've never heard it said better. I, I don't know who originated the quote. They said, the concept of the nice guy problem, or like you get friend zoned, or like, oh, I, I'm a nice guy, why don't women want me? And somebody responded to that and they said, the problem with this is that it assumes that women, what is this, that women are a machine that you put kindness coins into <laughs> until they pay sex. I'm like, that is exactly what that implies. If you just have to be nice, I mean, we've all played the video game, right? You talk to them six times in a row, you make the right dialogue choices, <laughs> and then Shepard gets to sleep with whoever he wants. 
And then you need like, you know, a real ish girl, you know, I mean, she's not modeled quite as well as the ones we play with in the video games. And, you know, there's some interesting bitmapping going on, but it'd be really nice to her, like maybe even as many as eight times in a row, and no sex comes out of her, and you're like, what the fuck? Let's just, can we all agree, right, kind of theoretically that that is like deeply sick and unhealthy behavior? We all know, right? Okay? Okay, now this makes more jokes. Um, yeah, like, I got really caffeinated out in Seattle, and uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that should be the title for my, like, my solo album. Okay, I really, I caffeinated in Seattle. Um, and I wandered into this subject I am mean, like extremely caffeinated. And I launched out, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I took about 10 minutes, and towards the end, I ended up talking about the sexist nature of frog. <laughs> it was kind of like an out-of-body experience, because I was there, and I was holding forth, and it was sort of like, you know, the Quakers have this belief that like anyone speaks up and God kind of speaks through them. And I was up there, and I could feel the words coming out of me. It was pure truth and light. And this tiny part of my brain is like, what the fuck are you saying about Frogger? You have gone crazy. You have gone crazy. And of all the games to pick on, Frogger? You're gonna to to unpack the bias of Frogger? <laughs> so I just kind of wrote it out, you know, finished that, and was like, oh, welcome to my thing, buy my book, Frogger. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, let's just never speak of this again, right? I'm gonna pretend it never happened. And then in the signing line, somebody comes through and he goes, What do you said about Frogger? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, and he goes, I thought about it that way. He goes, you're right. And I'm like, oh shit. Man. Of all the responses I was expecting, you're right. I never expect that one. Generally speaking, uh, when you agree with me, it, it really it just makes both of us look bad. Um, got a little bit of time left. What's that? Oh, just please don't ask me to make the same mistake twice. I do that. I do that on my own enough. Don't encourage my bad behavior. No, no, no. Okay, how about this? You know, at some point in the cruise, they, they apparently you can do these little things where I say, I'm going to be at a place and we'll talk about things. I'll figure out how to do that and then I'll do it. And if you really want to know what's wrong, we can do it there. Maria, make sure that happens. Because <laughs> I'm not an adult and I can't figure things out. Um, 